Now, the truth behind the clues painted into Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece. Roses carved into a Scottish chapel. Medieval knights frozen in effigy. A mysterious code left in a Paris church. Legend is what is written or told when a story's truth is too dangerous. What's real? What's not? Go beyond the Da Vinci Code. The year was 1244. Flames lashed the calm country air of a tiny mountain village in southern France. A funeral pyre raged as a solemn line of men, women, and children were led into the flames. To some, these 13th century Cathar villagers were true believers. To the medieval church, they were heretics, hunted, besieged, and ultimately condemned. The church ordered wholesale extermination of the Cathars. An army of 40,000 men descended on the south of France with a mandate to uh, destroy everything. Thousands of Cathar souls would eventually die, apparently martyrs for their faith, a fact of history. But some believe they marched to their deaths to keep a secret a secret so dangerous it could threaten the very foundations of the church. According to the Da Vinci Code, it's a scene of persecution that will be played out over and over again across the centuries. Even society's elite would be targeted to keep the secret from being revealed. But what is this dangerous idea? It's the idea at the center of the phenomenal bestseller, The Da Vinci Code, a work that cleverly combines real history with completely fictional events. To separate truth from myth, we must first take a 2,000-year journey through the strange alternative history suggested by the book, and then explore which parts are real and which are mere invention. None of the material, heretical, or orthodox in the Da Vinci Code is actually new. It's all been around for many centuries in theological works and history works. It's a new 21st century reworking of the Grail theme and some other older themes. This material has caused a lot of us to re-examine um, what we believe and why. According to the Da Vinci Code, there is a secret belief so powerful it's been preserved for a thousand years by a shadowy medieval cult. A truth so revolutionary, it's responsible for the death of kings. A heresy allegedly encoded into the works of one of history's great artists. I think the Da Vinci Code is a very important phenomena because it shows that people are open to and looking for, perhaps, an alternative understanding of Christianity. The Da Vinci Code boldly rewrites the legend of the Holy Grail and calls into question the accepted foundations of the Christian faith. Now we are suddenly fixed with the idea, well, maybe they didn't tell us everything. Suddenly, when we read Dan Brown's book, people are saying, Goodness gracious, I wonder what else they forgot to tell us. Could any of the Da Vinci Code's claims be real? Is it possible Leonardo da Vinci painted secret, heretical clues into some of the world's most famous pieces of art? Is it possible that the true origins of Christianity were obscured or rewritten by the early church fathers? Could these churches in Europe hold the key to a true, holy bloodline? Most people come to the Da Vinci Code not having heard any of this before. These are very, very powerful and compelling ideas which have certain resonances with historical fact, with new scholarship that's being done, 
and which most people have not heard, and so they find it shocking, stunning, fascinating to contemplate. This is a way of writing for a popular kind of audience. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that this is fiction. The plot of Dan Brown's novel depends upon a story told long before the Da Vinci Code was written. He builds on the idea that Mary Magdalene, one of Christ's followers, is also his partner. That she is, in fact, his wife. And that she will eventually come to be worshipped alongside him as a goddess. I believe that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married, that they were actually partners, that Jesus embodied the archetype of God as bridegroom, and Mary embodied the archetype of God as bride. The belief that Jesus and Mary Magdalene may have had an intimate relationship is also found in the historical survey, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. It is more plausible for a man to have been married, had children, and a claim to a throne than that he had been born of a virgin, walk on water, and rise from the dead. The Da Vinci Code also makes the claim that Mary is pregnant by Jesus at the crucifixion and that she is forced to escape to save both herself and her offspring. A French legend, dating back to about A.D. 900, says that she flees to Egypt, where her secret would remain safe. There, she gives birth to a daughter, whom she names Sarah, the one true descendant of Jesus, and heir to his kingdom on earth. The child's name, Sarah, in Hebrew, means princess. So I believe that that child is actually a legendary reference to the bloodline. This controversial account, however, is in conflict with conventional belief. There is no evidence whatsoever for any bloodline stemming from Jesus to the present day. None whatsoever. Still, the legend claims Sarah and her mother do not remain in Egypt. At around age 12, Sarah is taken by Mary and others across the Mediterranean to the shores of southern France. We have a legend that says that Mary Magdalene and her friends in 42 AD showed up on the shores of France in a boat with no oars and they brought with them the blood royal. And there, the Da Vinci Code claims that Sarah's descendants marry into a line of kings, the Merovingians, actual medieval monarchs from the Dark Ages of French history. Is there evidence that suggests a continuation of um, a bloodline running from Jesus to uh, the Merovingians? Well, yes, possibly. Uh, certainly there is evidence, or what can be construed as evidence, but I must stress that evidence is not proof. The Merovingians ruled southern France for some 300 years. But by 751, their power had waned. So, according to the Da Vinci Code, a new effort is needed to keep the holy bloodline alive. Modern attempts to address the story have inevitably involved a secret or semi-secret society known as the Priole de Sion, Priory of Zion. Certainly, such a society existed once upon a time. In fact, a real Priory of Sion was formed in 1099. But in the fictional world of the Da Vinci Code, the Priory's goal is nothing less than to protect the bloodline of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, spelled out in the Sangreal, or Royal Blood Documents. In order to do so, the Priory is said to have created one of the most intriguing groups in history, the Knights Templar. We see in their eyes the need for, we might call it crack security troops. You could think of the Templars as the warrior monks of the Crusades. The Templars were real. But in the Da Vinci Code, the knights are sent by the Priory of Sion to find these documents in the ruins of Solomon's Temple, 
they allegedly contain a genealogy of Jesus' descendants. It is certainly possible that the Templars found something. If they found anything, nobody knows what they might have found. According to the Da Vinci Code, the documents and the explosive truth they hold are allegedly used by the Templars to blackmail the church. In short order, they become powerful and rich and a target. In October 1307, Friday the 13th, King Philippe mounted a surprise attack on the Templar Knights in France. Their ranks were imprisoned, and their leaders captured and killed, sending shockwaves throughout Europe. Today it would be as though we open up the newspaper and hear that every single executive of a very powerful bank or company, such as IBM, was arrested worldwide at dawn. But in the Da Vinci Code, some of them escape and flee back to Europe with the secrets of the Sangreal documents. The documents are placed with the Priory of Sion for safekeeping. According to the Da Vinci Code, a search for the documents is launched by the church, which wants to destroy them. This search for the Sangreal documents becomes the search for the Holy Grail. The main view many of us have of the Holy Grail today is that of a cup or a chalice, particularly perhaps the cup that held the blood of Christ. But in the Da Vinci Code, it's Mary Magdalene herself who holds the blood of Christ. Her womb carries his child. She is the Grail. Through the centuries, the Priory of Sion hides this truth from the church. The documents that prove the holy bloodline are passed from one priory grand master to the next. They eventually reach the most famous grand master of them all, Leonardo da Vinci, or so the story goes. Leonardo is a very charismatic figure, a very enigmatic figure. He's an Einstein. He's someone who thinks in brilliant uh, new ways, new brilliant uh, paradigms. The Da Vinci Code asserts that Leonardo encoded this secret knowledge into his artwork. In The Last Supper, for example, the novel makes the claim that the feminine-looking figure seated on Jesus' right is not John the Beloved Disciple, as is commonly believed. Instead, he is a she, Mary Magdalene. Da Vinci seems to have known this tradition because he's clearly painted Mary Magdalene with Jesus at the Last Supper, as it should have been, but as it isn't now. Was Leonardo really trying to tell us something? Did he indeed hide clues in his most famous paintings? Is this the most explosive secret of all time, or is it something else entirely? Centuries worth of clues await. They begin with some early accounts of Mary Magdalene not found in the Bible and which have been hidden in the desert for 2,000 years. The Christian religion began on a cross 20 centuries ago, all based on the life and teachings of a man whose followers believe is the Son of God. But what of the woman crying at the foot of the cross? Mary Magdalene, sinner, prostitute. That's the image history painted of her. But what if this image is wrong? What if her tears are those of a wife crying for the father of her unborn child? It's the radical new view of Christianity's origins suggested by the Da Vinci Code. I believe that Mary Magdalene had a very special relationship with Jesus. In fact, I believe that they modeled partnership for the earliest community of Christians, and that they were actually husband and wife. It is a belief that says that the woman usually remembered as a prostitute was the person Jesus chooses 
to carry on the faith. Further, after the crucifixion, she would flee Jerusalem for another land and give birth to a daughter, the true heir of the faith. An incredible alternative history kept secret for 2,000 years. But where did such ideas come from? In the remote deserts of Egypt in 1945, a set of documents was discovered that would cast the early centuries of Christianity in a strange new light. Ancient writings found near the town of Nag Hammadi that contained ideas about the religion of Jesus not found in the Bible. We know that these are authentic documents and real sources that come from very early, from the very first centuries after the death of Jesus. The documents are called the Gnostic Gospels, and they were written by a Christian sect in the second century. They include writings like the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas, and the Gospel of Mary. And they record very unorthodox accounts of the life of Jesus. The Gospel of Philip says that Jesus often kissed Mary on her and then there's a blank, a hole in the papyrus. So we don't know whether he kissed her mouth, her forehead, her cheek, her shoulder. We're not really sure, but we do know that the other apostles were jealous of their intimacy. The Gnostic Christians who wrote these passages were not a mainstream sect but their writings are part of what the Da Vinci Code asserts is a lost history of Christianity. The whole of the Christian Gnosis is about the revelation of what the Christians called the Christ within, which is that what we really are is not a thing, is not a body, it's that we are awareness. The idea of finding Christ from within, rather than through the church, is another concept that distinguishes the Gnostics from other early Christians. And there is more. We have a kind of idealized reconstruction of Christian origins in which there was some sort of equality between Jesus' disciples, both male and female, in a non-hierarchical, shall we say, more democratic community. The idea that Mary Magdalene might have been Christ's equal, his wife, and the mother of his child, are roles not found in the biblical account. Views the Da Vinci Code suggests are ultimately censored by the early church, which is supposedly why the Gnostic Gospels have to be hidden in the deserts of Egypt. But even in the Bible, Mary Magdalene emerges as a prominent follower of Jesus. Mary Magdalene is present during his ministry, during Jesus' crucifixion, and she's the first identified apostle, first identified disciple who has a vision of the resurrected Jesus. What else we know about Mary Magdalene in the New Testament is that she, along with other women, is identified as, if you like, bankrolling the ministry of Jesus. Mary Magdalene is mentioned in all four of the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. She's mentioned on eight separate lists that include other women, and on seven of those eight lists, she's mentioned first. So although the scripture never says that she's First Lady, she's the preeminent Mary in the Gospels. Of course, the image she's most associated with is that of the repentant prostitute. In fact, it's an age-old misconception. There's no scriptural evidence that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. I believe the identification of the woman who anointed Jesus with a sinner, which happens only in Luke's Gospel, was the foundation for this belief, this widespread belief that Mary Magdalene may have been a prostitute. Luke's text is very clear. There was a woman of the city who was a sinner. No name, but tradition wants to supply names. And so in the Western tradition, this figure becomes identified with Mary. It was Pope Gregory the Great who labeled her a prostitute in the sixth century. 
but it wasn't to suppress a feminist view of Christianity. Gregory didn't do it to trash women. Gregory did it to help people realize that even with their sense of sin and worthlessness, that God loved them enough to restore them to grace. As for whether there's evidence that the Gnostic Gospels were deliberately destroyed or hidden, at the time the Gnostic texts were written, the Church had not yet established the four Gospels now found in the Bible. The Gnostic texts may not have been hidden at all. They were lost. They were lost to antiquity. We don't know that they were deliberately hidden. We can't assume that just because they are not included in the canon that somebody was trying to hide them. The Gnostic Gospels serve as an important source for the Da Vinci Code. But the few biblical references to Mary Magdalene's relationship with Jesus in the accepted Gospels doesn't prove or disprove that they were married or had a child. And even if they did, these aren't ideas that would necessarily be suppressed. In the earliest uh, first century, we know that it was incumbent on a Jewish father to find a wife for his son before the young man turned 20. There are very few exceptions. So Christ having a family would not automatically undermine his message. It's not important that he is regarded as celibate. It's not important that he is regarded as married. What's important is what model he provides for the way in which God cares about humanity. Furthermore, the notion of finding Christ within, rather than through the church, might have seemed threatening to the authorities. All of which makes the Da Vinci Code's claim of a 2,000-year cover-up appear plausible. The question remains, what if Mary actually were pregnant at the crucifixion? She couldn't remain in Jerusalem with the child of a crucified Messiah. But where would she go? and what would be the fate of her child? It's the central question of the Da Vinci Code, and it launches us on nothing less than a quest for the Holy Grail. The quest for the Holy Grail has been the passion of many through the ages. A strange idea if you consider it to be the search for a simple cup, but the Da Vinci Code suggests it's something more. Today, we often think of that as a quest for a material object, like treasure, a chalice, gold, or something like that. But actually, in the medieval versions of the story, it was a quest for something transcendent or spiritual. Something very much beyond our everyday, ordinary world. We have a symbol of the Holy Grail, which is a chalice or vessel that once contained the blood of Christ. And the vessel is an archetypal symbol for the feminine. The earth as vessel, the mother as vessel, the womb as vessel. If the history behind the Da Vinci Code is true, it's the vessel that carries the daughter of Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene herself is the Holy Grail. And if she really carries Christ's child, then those who crucified Jesus might come after her as well. She has to escape Jerusalem. But where would she go? Clues to that answer lie in legends of the Holy Grail. Grail stories are set everywhere from Palestine to England. But one legend essential to our history says that Mary and her unborn child seek refuge in Egypt with the uncle of the Virgin Mary, Joseph of Arimathea. I think Joseph of Arimathea took Mary Magdalene with him from Jerusalem to Alexandria. That's where her legends and myths go. And they would have found a large quarter in Alexandria of Jewish people where they could have fit right in. 
Once in Egypt, the legend says Mary Magdalene gives birth to a daughter, Sarah, and raises her there until the age of 12. Then, around AD 42, Mary, Sarah, Joseph, and others are said to leave Egypt and sail, in a boat with no oars, to the marshy shores of Gaul, the Roman province that is now southern France. You now have a legend that says that they brought with them the blood royal. We well, don't carry the blood royal in a jar with a lid. It flows in the veins of a child. Some stories trace them to this very coastline, near the town of Saint-Marie-de-la-Mer. Here, Mary and her daughter would live out the rest of their lives. What is indisputable fact is that uh, certainly there were Judaic communities scattered around the south of France. And it is certainly likely that any refugee from Palestine at the time would have found refuge amongst some such community. Today, a grand church dating back to the ninth century commemorates this belief. It is dedicated to two figures from scripture, Mary Jacobi, sister of the Holy Virgin, and Mary Salome, the mother of two apostles, St. James the Great and St. John. According to church lore, both Marys accompanied Joseph and Mary Magdalene to France. And they're depicted here in a boat with no oars. But beyond this, the church hosts a shrine to one of the most unique figures in Christian lore. A young, dark-skinned girl stands as a religious icon next to an ancient crypt. The girl is known as Sarah the Egyptian. Most of the legends in southern France claim that Sarah is a servant girl brought here by Mary Magdalene and the others. But another version claims that Sarah is Mary's daughter, born in Egypt, the sole blood descendant of Jesus Christ. But were we to follow the more familiar path of the Holy Grail, it would lead us not to France, but to Glastonbury, England, where a majestic abbey built in the 12th century once stood. Stories claim that this is where Joseph of Arimathea brings the Grail for safekeeping. Could Mary and Sarah have arrived here? By the mid 14th century, the abbot there, John of Glastonbury, then brought in the actual grail romance material about Joseph Arimathea and Glastonbury's site into the story. And certainly it wasn't until the late 15th century that the monks of Glastonbury Abbey themselves actually began to promulgate that story. The looming Glastonbury Tor now marks what legend says is the entrance to the underworld and the place where Joseph buries the Grail. Thereafter, a spring begins to flow with curiously reddish waters, emblematic of the blood of Christ spilling from the sacred cup. These waters still flow from what is called the Chalice Well. And believers from around the world visit this site, seeking what they claim are the spring's supernatural healing properties. Whether the Grail ever made it to England or to France, as suggested in the Da Vinci Code, is a matter for debate among Grail theorists but an increasing number of scholars are beginning to take a second look at Mary Magdalene herself. Is the Mona Lisa smiling because she knows a secret about Mary that we don't?
The Da Vinci Code alleges that clues to Leonardo's heretical beliefs can be found in some of his most famous paintings. Is the Mona Lisa smiling because she knows something about Mary Magdalene? Is the angel Uriel threatening the Virgin Mary in his Madonna of the Rocks? Dan Brown contends that Leonardo and other artists held heretical beliefs that they were unable to express in public for fear of religious reprisals. Their belief in the sacred feminine, the divine generative power of woman, is at the core of his novel. According to the Da Vinci Code, Leonardo's work is riddled with clues that point to a secret knowledge about Mary Magdalene, that he was trying to keep alive legends that had been forced underground by the church authorities. Legend is what is written or told when a story's truth is too dangerous. So it's very possible that legends hold kernels and fossils of truth. I believe that the sacred union of Christ and Mary Magdalene was at the very heart of the Christian story and that it was sadly, even tragically, lost in the early dawn of the Christian experience and written out of the story. According to the Da Vinci Code, the worship of Mary Magdalene is forced underground in the year A.D. 325 at a special conference of bishops convened by the Roman Emperor Constantine. It is called the Council of Nicaea. At the Council of Nicaea, Constantine's agenda is to form a coherent and simple form of Christianity to which all these different warring bishops can sign up. They all have different opinions about everything. He wants one church, one empire, one emperor. And the basic deal is, you come to Nicaea, you sign up to the creed, you get to stay at a long party at the emperor's expense, you don't sign up, you get exiled from the empire, which pretty much means death in the ancient world. And so a clash is inevitable. The church sets its eyes on the Gnostics and condemns their beliefs as heresy. And the religion starts becoming very male and traces of the impulse towards the sacred feminine start being eradicated in various ways, including what is declared to be heretical thoughts and what is adopted as official text for the New Testament. Especially the notion that Mary Magdalene gave birth to a daughter and that there are living descendants of Jesus himself. So Constantine had the Gnostic texts destroyed leaving only the traditional Gospels now found in the Bible, or so says the Da Vinci Code. The truth about Christian origins is lost because there's only one history which is allowed to survive, and it's written by Bishop Eusebius, who is Constantine's spin doctor, his propagandist. But did the Council of Nicaea really rewrite Christian history? Or are believers in the Da Vinci Code trying to do just that? There are no discussions in the deliberations of the Christian councils about including or excluding books that specifically identify the non-canonical texts we have today from the Nag Hammadi Library in English. Those Gospels unearthed at Nag Hammadi, like the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas, and the Gospel of Mary, are all very unorthodox accounts of the life of Jesus. According to religious historians, there was no debate at the Council of Nicaea about censoring any of those texts or selecting the books that would become the official version of the faith. The decision about what got included or excluded or regarded as suspicious, three categories of whether material could be in or out of the canon, was not established until the end of the third, beginning of the fourth century. What we do not have is anybody saying, the Gospel of Thomas, out. The canon actually evolved over several centuries, and the 27 books now found in the New Testament were not compiled until 42 years after the Council of Nicaea. The claim that other records of Christianity's origins were destroyed in this period is a great overstatement. Book burnings did occur, but centuries later 
and for different reasons. The idea in the Da Vinci Code that the church is out to quash the Mary legend has found support from those who cite its ties to an ancient Egyptian myth. Under this theory, the early church would have been anxious to erase anything that connected their New Testament story to pagan worship rituals. Their dying and resurrecting God-man is Osiris, who dies, comes back to life, ascends to heaven, and is the judge of the quick and the dead. And his consort, his goddess figure, is Isis. And it arises in Christianity as Jesus, who dies and resurrects, and his consort, who's Mary Magdalene. Christ and Magdalene in the eyes of the early community may have been a re-embodiment of that same principle of the sacred union embodied in the Isis Osiris myth. The Da Vinci Code suggests that for the church, a faith based on this sacred union is too much like the pagan beliefs they are trying to replace. Beliefs that celebrate the sexual union between deities. It had to be stopped. But traditional Christian scholars argue that to see Mary Magdalene as a goddess goes beyond what the sources tell us. There's nothing that really connects the goddess traditions of Isis with, with Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene isn't a goddess in Christian tradition. You could read in texts about the wisdom figure. You could read in texts about Isis and so on. But then you're going beyond the text. You're creating something in the image that you want. Beyond this, Mary Magdalene herself was made a saint. Not something the church would do if it wanted to vilify her or erase her from history. And in 1969, the church officially cleared Mary Magdalene of the label of prostitute. Yet the legends behind the Da Vinci Code hold that Mary's true legacy had to be extinguished by the church to prevent her descendants from challenging its authority to lead the Christian world. Those descendants are said to keep alive the holy bloodline by marrying into a line of kings, the Merovingian kings, a real line of monarchs from the Dark Ages, about whom bizarre tales are told. A century ago, in the isolated village of Rennes-le-Chateau, high in the Pyrenees Mountains of southern France, Father Béranger Saunière, a poor country priest and namesake of the murdered Louvre curator in the Da Vinci Code, Jacques Saunière, began a renovation of his church, an event that would give rise to a remarkable legend made famous by the novel. But this was no ordinary renovation. Saunière does a number of strange things that some would consider heretical. Near the entrance, Saunière installed a demonic figure to support a fountain. There is the image of Christ's body being removed from his burial tomb under dark of night, instead of being resurrected. And he constructed a tower dedicated to Mary Magdalene, the follower of Jesus, usually recalled as a prostitute. The legend says that during the renovation, a Visigoth column is removed from its foundation. And inside, Saunière allegedly makes an astonishing discovery. Ancient parchments that tell a story, a 2,000-year saga that rewrites Christian history and threatens the legitimacy of the church to which Saunière has dedicated his life. These writings, called the Dossier Secret, support the idea of a holy bloodline that reaches back from the present day to a dynasty of medieval French kings, monarchs who may have carried the bloodline of Jesus Christ. It's a story detailed in the 1982 bestseller Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which first brought the idea of a holy bloodline to a mass audience. All we attempted to do was ask the question, is it plausible? Is it plausible that Jesus could have been married, that he could have had a bloodline or children? Is it plausible that those children could have intermarried to produce a Merovingian dynasty? Our conclusions were simply that, yes, these things are plausible. 
We have the legend of the Holy Grail, that Mary Magdalene and her friends brought the Holy Grail to France. And we surmise that that Holy Grail is a child of the sacred bloodline, the royal blood of Israel, of King David and of Jesus. In the Da Vinci Code, that child's descendants marry into a line of French kings, the Merovingians, real-life royals of the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries, who became the basis of fantastic tales. The Merovingians were credited with the capacity to heal by the laying on of hands, and the capacity to speak to beasts, to enjoy a kind of um, clairvoyant rapport with the natural world. Despite such claims, Merovingian rule did not last. By the year 751, their power had faded. The last of the Merovingians was Dagobert II, whom legend says married a Visigoth princess. But his reign lasted only three years. It ended abruptly while sleeping during a hunting expedition. According to the legends, he was asleep under a tree in the Ardennes forest and was killed by a lance through the eye. There is some evidence, evidence, not proof, evidence, that the church colludes in the assassination of Dagobert II. It's a saga supposedly recorded in the Dossier Secret, allegedly found in the Visigoth column at Rennes-le-Chateau and echoed in the Da Vinci Code. But in reality, the connection between Jesus and Dagobert, the last of the Merovingians, remains unproven. I don't know of any proof that the bloodline actually survived into the Merovingian times. All we have is legends, and the genealogies don't always hold up through the Dark Ages. Dagobert himself existed, but there's no proof he was part of a holy bloodline. And other accounts of his death claim he was the victim of a rival clan, not a church assassin. Furthermore, the Visigoth column that was moved during Saunier's renovation doesn't have a hollow space large enough for any secret documents. But tales of a holy bloodline don't die here. According to the Da Vinci Code, there is another set of documents, far older, that contain nothing less than a genealogy tracing directly back to Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Ancient writings called the Sangreal documents. Sangreal being a medieval word referring to the Holy Grail. When the Grail is first mentioned, it is cited as one word, Sangreal. Somebody back in the Middle Ages arbitrarily broke it after the N and before the G, and the result was San Glal, Sainted Grail. If, however, you break the word San Glal a letter later after the G, you come up with San Glal or San Real, Blood Royal. Could we be talking about a bloodline? A bloodline descended from Jesus. With the Sangreal documents, the story moves from France to Jerusalem, to the ruins of Solomon's Temple, where the Da Vinci Code claims these ancient scrolls were hidden. In order to rouse the populace and get the Crusades launched, this idea was spread that we were going to send our troops into the Holy Land and we were going to find the relics, including the Holy Grail. The leader of the First Crusade, Godfroy de Bouillon, is of Merovingian descent. If you trace his pedigree or his genealogy back, you will find that he is indeed descended from the Merovingians. History does record that in July 1099, the Crusaders defeated the Turks, and a triumphant Godfroy de Bouillon was crowned the King of Jerusalem. And according to the Da Vinci Code, that same year, he established the Priory of Sion, a shadowy cult to protect the Holy Bloodline for the next 10 centuries. There is documented proof that in 1099, when Jerusalem was captured by the Crusaders, a group of religious initiates were installed in an abbey on top of Mount Zion and became an order, the Order of Zion. 
a medieval priory of Sion did in fact exist. But in the novel, this priory has a secret mission, to acquire the Sangreal documents. To retrieve them from Jerusalem, the novel claims the priory establishes a military unit, an order of poor knights called the Knights Templar. The Templars are a fact of history, established to protect European pilgrims during the Crusades. They were headquartered in the ruins of Solomon's Temple, from which they got their name. The Knights Templar occupy the Temple Mount. This is a historical fact. The Knights Templar occupied the Temple of Solomon for nine years or 11 years, depending on which account you believe. And then the Knights Templar become incredibly powerful. And Dan Brown alleges that they become powerful because they find this secret knowledge. Exploring the dusty recesses of Jerusalem's holiest shrine, they come upon what the novel claims are the most important writings in Christendom, the Sangreal documents, the documentary proof of a holy bloodline stemming back through the Merovingian kings to the daughter of Jesus Christ. It's for this reason, says the Da Vinci Code, that the fortunes of the poor knights radically change. They could use this secret to blackmail the church. They had amassed a great deal of money. They were the wealthiest institution in Christendom at the time. They are also very secretive, and because of this, highly suspect. Historians record strange rumors against them about perverse practices and bizarre beliefs. It was alleged that they had rituals involving trampling on the cross and repudiating Jesus. It was alleged that they were guilty of sodomy. It was alleged that uh, they were guilty of rape. Enemies even claimed they ceremonially worshipped the head of John the Baptist because he was the original teacher of Christ. No matter how fantastic the charges, there was someone ready to believe them. While the Templars were actually heroic in many respects, their combination of wealth and secrecy made them enemies of the French king and the church. We see a collusion between King Philip IV of France at the time and Pope Clement V. They both were threatened by what we might call a growing power block of the United Templar. On Friday, 13th of October, 1307, and this is why Friday the 13th is deemed unlucky. Acting on secret orders from King Philippe, his seneschals, marshals, servitors descended on all Templar installations in France and arrested every night they could. The records show they were rounded up, tortured, and executed. While the tragic end to the Templars is true, most of the accusations against them were not. We know many of the charges were certainly exaggerated. They were not found guilty as charged, but rather the Pope decided that the charges were what they now call the verdict of not proven. They were not proven charges, as opposed to guilty per se. And what does the archaeological evidence say about their finding scrolls in the ruins of the temple? There have been a few artifacts found, mainly spurs of horses and a few remnants of swords, but that is not the same as a cache of treasure or gold or scrolls. Nor did the Templar's wealth come from blackmailing the church. It came from popular support. They were given land by nobles all throughout Europe and elsewhere. And the Knights Templar can be said to have established Western Europe's first multinational corporate banking system in medieval times. After a while, the assets were very considerable. As for why they were disbanded, their original mission was to protect Christian pilgrims approaching Jerusalem. 
But by 1312, the Holy Land was back in Muslim control. So, that year, they were disbanded. Most importantly, were the Knights established by a priory of Sion? There is no documentable historical evidence at all that there is any connection between the medieval order of the Knights Templar and what has been called the Priory of Sion. But the history of the Templars is so shrouded in mystery, it still leaves room to speculate about why their order was formed, why they were attacked, and, if the Da Vinci Code is to be believed, how some of them may have escaped Jerusalem with the Sangreal documents. Back to Europe they race, with the scrolls that would someday be immortalized as the Holy Grail. Back to the Priory of Sion for safekeeping. Once safely in hand, their extraordinary story would be preserved for a day far in the future when the truth could be revealed. Through the dark centuries, the secret would pass from one grand master of the Priory to the next. And if the tale is true, among that secret brotherhood is one of the most brilliant men who ever lived. There are many theories as to what the Holy Grail really is. The cup Christ used at the Last Supper. The chalice that held his blood at the crucifixion. Is it Mary Magdalene herself? Or is it also, as the Da Vinci Code suggests, the Sangreal documents, the genealogy of Christ's family tree? If the Templar Knights really did find these documents in Jerusalem and escape with them back to Europe, what becomes of them? And how would their record of the offspring of Jesus and Mary Magdalene endure through the Middle Ages? The Templars supposedly bring them to their masters, the Priory of Sion, guardians of the Holy Bloodline. They would preserve the secret heresy. But if legend is to be believed, they would not be alone. In the 12th and 13th centuries, communities of heretics flourished throughout the south of France. They were called the Cathars, and they held many beliefs strongly opposed by the church. The Cathars are not featured in the Da Vinci Code, but they are discussed in the 1982 book Holy Blood, Holy Grail a non-fiction investigation into much of the alternative history later found in the Da Vinci Code. They regarded women as equal, did not differentiate between um, the sexes. Qatar preachers could be women as well as men. The Cathars actually used caves as secret temples where they nurtured ideas that included this equality of the sexes. Beliefs deemed threatening by the church in a cavern near the city of Foix, the Cathars are said to have worshipped before this indentation in the rock wall, a pentagon, and inside it, a star, a pentacle. The geometric shape the Da Vinci Code claims is an ancient symbol of the sacred feminine. But such heretical beliefs are only part of the reason why the church opposed them. The Cathars were preaching against the transgressions of the church, the opulence of the church, the inequities of the church, the extent to which church figures lived in luxury and opulence while the peasantry starved. And beyond all this, legend says that the Cathars are keepers of a great treasure, though no one is sure what it is. Could it be the Sangreal documents? Whatever it is, it supposedly earned the Cathars the wrath of the French king and the church. It allegedly inspires the Inquisition. And in 1209, it would launch the Albigensian Crusade. The Inquisition was created specifically to combat the Cathar heresy. There was no Inquisition prior to the Albigensian Crusade. It was the first crusade to occur in Europe, on European soil, as opposed to the Holy Land. It 
It was also the first crusade to be waged by Christians against other Christians. These soldiers of the French king were sent to defend the Orthodox faith. The Albigensian crusade continued for four decades as Cathar villages were attacked throughout southern France. In 1244, one of the last attacks took place at this mountaintop fortress at Montsegur. Crusaders laid siege to the remote monastery for 10 long months, but the attackers prevailed. Eventually, Montsegur fell, and the Qatar defenders voluntarily, rather than convert to Catholicism, voluntarily walked into the flames, allowed themselves to be burned. Historically, the real reason the Cathars were attacked by the King of France was to seize their property. Heresy was an excuse for a massive land grab. Beyond these facts, a popular French legend dating back to the 13th century says the day before the fall of Montsegur, four monks escaped down the sheer cliff with the mysterious Cathar treasure. Given the sheer nature of the cliff, there's no way they could be carrying vast quantities of um, gold, for example. Whatever they were carrying must have been relatively portable. It might have been the Sangreal documents, which the church wanted destroyed. This is pure speculation. But if it's true, the sacred scrolls and the holy bloodline they prove are once again moved across Europe and hidden from religious authorities. Moved from place to place by the Priory of Sion, they are passed from one generation of Grand Masters to the next, until they reach the most famous Grand Master of all. A Florentine artist who seems to embody the spirit of free thought, independent of religious dogma. Leonardo is a very charismatic figure, a very enigmatic figure. I think the word enigma is there immediately when you think of Leonardo. It is this fusion of art and science that typifies the Renaissance and the works of Leonardo. But according to the Da Vinci Code, among his interests is a belief in Mary Magdalene and the sacred feminine, which he allegedly encodes into his art. I think he had a lot of hidden thoughts and secret thoughts, and I think some of them may be expressed in his paintings. The most famous example of Leonardo's hidden beliefs is the Last Supper. Legend says the Holy Grail was the cup that Christ drank from at this occasion, yet there is no sign of the Grail in the painting. Or is there? When I was reading the Da Vinci Code for the first time and came to the passage explaining that it's a woman in the painting, I went to my art books in the middle of the night and looked at the Last Supper again. I said, oh my, that is a woman in the painting. How come I've never noticed that? If you look at the painting of the Last Supper, it really does look like the figure that should be John is actually Mary. According to the Da Vinci Code, this figure is not John the Evangelist, but Mary Magdalene, the Holy Grail. Both she and Jesus are at the center of the picture, suggesting their roles as equals. In the painting, a disembodied dagger hovers to one side, perhaps representing the hostility some hold towards Mary's importance to Jesus. There is also Peter's hand, slicing through the air in a menacing gesture, expressing the Apostle's jealousy towards Mary and her role as Christ's partner. And in the middle of the entire composition, a large V shape, the symbol that allegedly ties together female worship with the Holy Grail and Mary Magdalene. 
we know that the grail is supposed to have been a vessel. And one of the ancient symbols for the feminine is the vessel, the V-shape, is the cup or the chalice, the womb, the vessel of life. It's the pubic triangle, if you will. Like the pentacle, the V is supposed to be an age-old icon of female deity. But is any of this encoded symbolism real? Leonardo da Vinci, like all artists, introduced symbols into his artwork so that audiences would recognize the visual meaning. But there were not heretical symbols put secretly into the work of art. In the Renaissance, there are a number of Last Suppers painted. We have many examples of them. John the Evangelist is always next to Christ. John the Evangelist is always feminine looking. He has long hair. He has a very beautiful face. And in no way can this be conceived as a hidden Mary Magdalene. The dagger on the left of the painting of Leonardo's Last Supper is the dagger of St. Bartholomew, one of the 12 disciples, who was flayed when he was martyred. As for the V-shape that symbolizes the cup and the womb and the sacred feminine, a principal contention in the Da Vinci Code. Why does V represent the sacred feminine? That is a concoction. That is not a theory that has any sort of legitimacy. V is not a symbol of the sacred feminine. Leonardo always made a dynamic composition. The V shape of the left hand portion is really for a dramatic effect. It has nothing to do with the sacred feminine. But if this figure is actually John, and the V-shape has no connection to the grail or the sacred feminine, then why does the Last Supper have no chalice in the picture at all? The Holy Grail is more about arthurial legend, King Arthur uh, and the English uh, literary tradition, and it's more about a 19th century romanticism than it is about uh, the Renaissance. Lastly, there is no evidence that Leonardo belonged to the Priory of Sion, as he does in the Da Vinci Code. The idea that Leonardo da Vinci would have been a grand master of the Priory of Sion, I think, is impossible. Leonardo was a loner. He was interested in his own thoughts and his own ideas. In Leonardo's 15 or so manuscripts, thousands and thousands of lines. There's no evidence for any involvement of Leonardo da Vinci in any secret religious organizations of the 15th and 16th century. But the story of the Sangreal documents and the quest for the Holy Grail may not end with the debunking of da Vinci's codes. Could these five-petaled roses, this brass line in a Paris church, and a glass pyramid at the Louvre point to the Grail's final resting place. Roslyn Chapel has often been called the Chapel of the Grail or a Bible in stone. In the Da Vinci Code, the art of Leonardo holds clues to a heretical belief that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were husband and wife that they spawned a holy bloodline recorded in the Sangreal documents. That the documents are found by the Templar Knights who escaped from the clutches of both Church and the King of France to protect the secrets they hold. But if forced out of France, where might the Templars take them? There were many other countries, of course, where there were Templars, Italy, Spain, parts of England. And in the Da Vinci Code, one possible hiding place is here. The Temple Church in London, which was actually built by Templar Knights and consecrated in 1185. Inside, this 800-year-old church has two distinct personalities. To one side is a large traditional space. It ends at an altar graced with stained glass art of Templars on horseback. But at the other end of the structure is an open chamber where effigies of ten Templars rise ominously from the floor. Patrons of the order buried on the church grounds dating back to the 13th century. 
and they are surrounded by ghastly faces from medieval nightmares. Most important is the chamber's round shape, which the Da Vinci Code suggests is a pagan temple in which sexual rites celebrating the sacred union of Jesus and Mary Magdalene might have been performed. Perhaps the Templars take refuge here, a sanctuary from a world hostile to the documents they protect and the bloodline they have vowed to defend. But is the church's round shape really evidence of such dark age intrigues? It's possibly more likely that the round design aspect came from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, because that is what the medieval Templars said they were swearing to defend. And the Church of the Holy Sepulchre back in Jerusalem is, in fact, round. In the Da Vinci Code, the Sangreal documents are kept in the London Temple for only one night before they're taken north to another, even more remote hideaway. Scotland. Outside the city of Edinburgh sits another shrine, allegedly built by the Templars in 1466, called Rosslyn Chapel. It's known in the novel as the Cathedral of Codes. Roslyn Chapel is not a cathedral. It was originally meant to be part of a much larger cathedral. However, it does have many very fascinating carvings, but from a variety of traditions, the Christian, the Jewish, the Pythagorean, the Rosicrucian, and other esoteric traditions. The Da Vinci Code claims these carvings are clues that tie together all the groups associated with the Holy Bloodline. Rosalind Chapel was built under the auspices of the family called the St. Clairs, particular Sir William Sinclair. William was allegedly descended from the Merovingians, the king said to carry the bloodline of Jesus. And this grave slab suggests St. Clair was also a Templar knight. Finally, he's linked to the Priory of Sion because in the novel, the St. Clairs are listed among the Priory's first Grand Masters. Thus, Roslyn links the Merovingians with the Templars with the Priory. Most scholars regard this as pure speculation. There is no connection at all between the medieval Knights Templar and the St. Clair family of Roslyn. There are what some believe to be Templar-related carving, which was used on the medieval Templars, the official seal. But because that carving is similar, it does not mean that the Templars built Rosalind Chapel. But there are more intriguing symbols found at Rosalind, including the pentacle and the rose, which in the Da Vinci Code are symbols for both the feminine and the Priory of Sion. On the ceiling, there is a five-pointed star. And next to that on the roof, we will see a panel of roses. The rose is also where Roslyn allegedly gets its name because it sits on something called the Rose Line. The novel identifies the Rose Line as the original prime meridian, the geographical marker of time zones, before it was moved to its present location in Greenwich, England. A rose line also runs right through another landmark in the novel, the Pyramid at the Louvre Museum in Paris, the place where the book's plot begins. And a symbol reminiscent of Egypt, the land where Mary Magdalene gives birth to the daughter of Jesus. It's also said to run through another point in Paris, the Church of Saint-Sulpice. At first, this massive church has the appearance of a traditional cathedral. But there are strange clues here as well. A stained glass window bears the letters P and S. Could this stand for the Priory of Sion? 
To one side of the nave is an Egyptian-style obelisk, again an icon of Egypt. And running down its center is a brass line, according to the Da Vinci Code, the Rose Line. From the cathedrals of Paris to the hills of Scotland, the Rose Line connects a continent-wide conspiracy to preserve the ancient truth of the Holy Bloodline. But it turns out there is less here than meets the eye. The P and S in the window of Saint-Sulpice stand for St. Peter, not the Priory of Sion. And the brass line running through the obelisk is simply an astronomical sun marker. It doesn't coincide with the meridian running through Paris, and it's never been called the Rose Line. In fact, the prime meridian doesn't run from Saint-Sulpice to Roslyn at all. The name Roslyn is not known for certain. There have been many theories put forth, but Roslyn Chapel does not derive its name from the Rose Line. As for other codes at Roslyn, there's no consensus that the five-pointed star is a symbol of the sacred feminine. I have nowhere found it signifying the feminine any more than it signifies numerous other things. To find a pentagram or pentacles somewhere and say, ah, that is the sacred feminine is nonsense. Nor is there evidence that a secret priory of Sion is symbolized by the rose. And it turns out the grave slab in the chapel tying Rosslyn's founder to the Templars was not even found at Rosslyn and doesn't refer to its founder. All of this would seem to unravel the story of a grand conspiracy to preserve a holy bloodline. But there are some clues that still linger. For one, this column, called the Apprentice Column, and this crouching angel, both known to be Masonic symbols. Significantly, the St. Clairs were actually Scottish Masons. The Masons began as a guild of medieval stonemasons, the builders of castles and cathedrals. But at one point, they claimed their society went back to the builders of Solomon's Temple. And this connected them to the Templar Knights. It was a myth that would have dramatic consequences. By the 1700s, they had evolved into a gentleman's club, advocating progressive ideas like democracy and secular government throughout Europe. Ideas that didn't sit well with King Louis XVI of France. So, when the French Revolution of 1789 overthrew the monarchy, many blamed it on a Masonic conspiracy to avenge the death of their ancestors, the Templars, the ancient enemies of the French king. Was this a conspiracy? Was it a conspiracy in France? If you were a rationalist and a free thinker in that time period, you would have favored the end of monarchy, you would have favored democracy, and you wouldn't have needed to be a secret conspiracy to believe these things. It was not a conspiracy. This belief is merely the latest in a long line of unproven claims. The Masons are not linked to the Templars. The Templars were not created by the Priory of Sion. The Priory did not protect a holy bloodline, and there is no proof that the Sangreal documents ever existed. So how did this incredible 2,000-year saga get started and wind up in a best-selling novel? In fact, there is a secret story behind the Da Vinci Code. It's not the one you've been hearing about. But it does start at the same place the false history begins, with Father Béranger Saunière and the mystery of Rennes le Château. The genius of the Da Vinci Code is how brilliantly it weaves together history, legend, and fantasy into an intriguing new tapestry. My view of Dan Brown and of the story told in the Da Vinci Code is the further he goes back in history, the more reasonable and interesting his ideas are. 
The more he goes up to the recent times, the more decoupled from real scholarship and academic thinking he becomes. Case in point, Father Saunier's alleged discovery of the dossier secret. The dossier secret are pivotal to the story. But if Father Saunier did not really find them in his church, where did they come from? They can be traced to a different source, a more modern source, and one that seems today to be less than credible. The dossiers secrets are first brought to the public's attention when, in 1956, a French newspaper, Le Dépêche du Midi, published stories about them after they were found in the French National Library in Paris. Who wrote them? Who placed them in the library? And why? It turns out they were placed there by a group that first registered with the French government in 1956, a group called the Priory of Sion. A completely modern organization whose grand master was a man named Pierre Plantard. Plantard, a myth. Plantard developed a myth whereby he was the only one who could save France during the war and after the war, saying that he was part of a secret society. It was his group that produced the dossier secret. They consist for the most part of page after page after page of genealogy. You go through them and you wonder what the devil is all this in name of. Um, what is it trying to prove? So bloody what? These documents try to prove, through a series of stories, that there is indeed a descendant of the Merovingians who is a lost king. In the first interview I did with him, I asked Plantard, what do you think of the story of the lost king? And Plantard answered, the lost king is not as far away as you think. I think Plantard and his circle were right-wing intellectuals and French nationalists who were trying to create a modern myth by using history and bits and pieces of facts and legends. It's completely clear to me that their creation of the Priory of Zion as a modern organization, their writing of these secret dossiers, their spinning of this myth of the Priory of Zion and this whole legend was an intentional act. Nevertheless, the documents sparked the interest of investigators like Richard Lee, who were intrigued by the idea of an ancient Priory of Sion. Old land transfer documents show there was a medieval priory. But it was a rather unremarkable Catholic order, and it didn't last. We were able to trace references to the Prix de Sion up until 1619. In 1619, we found a reference to the effect that their premises at the priory in Orléans was turned over to the Jesuits, and they were booted out. After that, we found no subsequent references to them until 1956. This investigation resulted in the publication of Holy Blood, Holy Grail in 1982. We were confronted by a group of people in Paris with a seemingly bizarre, bonkers objective, namely to restore a 1600-year-old bloodline. But Lee and his co-authors also added one more wrinkle they tied the Merovingians to Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Our conclusions were simply that, yes, these things are plausible. I can't say, nor will my co-authors say, that we believe them. We will certainly not argue that this was the case. This speculative history was ingeniously incorporated into the fiction of the Da Vinci Code. New elements like the sacred feminine and codes in Leonardo's art were then added. A phenomenon was born. It all makes for great fiction. 
But in France, where much of the legend takes place, the authentic history is well known, and few of the ideas in the Da Vinci Code are taken as fact. From the very beginning, and we're talking 30 years ago, everyone in France knew this was a hoax. Hoax or not, there's one more chapter of the Da Vinci Code to explore. One that reaches beyond the pages of the book. The Da Vinci Code is a story filled with clues, beginning with the death of a curator, splayed out like Leonardo's Vitruvian Man on the floor of the Louvre Museum. It's the first of many clues that leads to a temple in London, where effigies of knights who protect a holy bloodline now lie. To a church in Paris with a monument hinting that a daughter of Jesus is born in Egypt produces a line of descendants to a chapel in Scotland filled with icons of an ancient conspiracy to preserve the holy bloodline and a secretive cult that intends to finally reveal this shocking truth to the world all of these clues tend to lead us into dead ends but in the novel the actions of the Priory of Sion force the hand of a conservative religious group who seek to suppress knowledge of the Holy Bloodline. But this group exists beyond the pages of the novel. Opus Dei is an organization of the Catholic Church and its name is Latin and Opus Dei means work of God. And the aim of Opus Dei is to spread the message that everybody is called to holiness and they achieve holiness through their ordinary work and the duties of every day. The portrayal of Opus Dei is very inaccurate. It portrays Opus Dei as praying all day, as wearing monkish cowls and generally engaged in conspiracy theories. We go to Mass every day and we spend perhaps, uh, perhaps an hour in prayer every day, but almost all the time we're, we're in our, our homes or we are working just like everybody else. Headquartered in London and New York, the organization is growing rapidly, boasting some 80,000 members today. It's regarded by many as among the most conservative voices in the Catholic world. It's a personal prelature of the Pope, meaning that it exists within the Catholic Church, but separate from the normal structure. Opus Dei was established in 1928 by Father Jose Maria Escriva de Balaguer. Its stated goal is to contribute to the evangelizing mission of the Church and help people practice the lessons of the Gospel in everyday life. Their supporters contend they stand for traditional values, but their detractors accuse them of extreme beliefs and suspicious activities. The Da Vinci Code mentions one in particular. The book makes the allegation that the Vatican entered into a kind of corrupt bargain with Opus Dei, that Opus Dei lends the Vatican some money. This is a very damaging allegation and it's quite the most outrageous thing in the book, and it is completely false. Beyond this, it's claimed that the group practices medieval rites like self-inflicted pain as a means to salvation. It's called self-mortification, and Opus Dei does practice it, although in a very mild form. Some members use the psyllis some of the time, and that's a kind of... Um, band made of wire that goes around the leg. The idea is that if you practice more mortifications, when the hour of temptation comes, you'll have moral fiber, moral backbone, and you'll avoid being a, a kind of jellyfish and, and caving in. It's not something exclusive to Opus Dei. Whatever one thinks of their beliefs, one fact is clear. 
there was never a mission to extinguish the holy bloodline from history because Opus Dei does not believe a holy bloodline exists. For its part, Opus Dei has no interest in the Da Vinci Code's grand fictional conspiracy. But the international success of Dan Brown's book shows that it has struck a chord with modern readers. And there are plenty of theories as to why. The possibility that things may be happening in the world around us over which we have no control is disturbing. Conspiracy theories are comforting. Uh, they suggest a human agency is at work. You've got somebody to blame or somebody to join. I think many people today are attempting to link back to an earlier tradition or get to the roots of the truth. And so this is a thriller novel that has actually been a profound catalyst. What it shows, its popularity shows, is that people are open to and looking for a new interpretation of Christianity. The book, although it is allegedly based on historical fact, is entirely fictive. It represents what might be still to be experienced or to be found or discovered. So it represents a sort of eternal quest. In the final analysis, Dan Brown's book seems to raise many questions, but tends to leave the answers up to the reader. When you really analyze even the Da Vinci Code as literary text, we're not clear. Is he telling us it's the relics of Mary Magdalene physically? Is he telling us it's a body of documents? Is he telling us that it's buried under Roslyn Chapel? Is he telling us that it was dug up and moved and placed under the new Louvre Museum in Paris? It's a very inconsistent story that Dan Brown encourages us to, uh, to contemplate, but really doesn't provide any answers.